All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's have a seat real quick, guys. We're going to have our next speaker come up, Hudson Bush, who's a security architecture design. He does index modeling in every little thing he does. Uh, as a job, he actually works with government compliance, business impact analysis, and risk management. Today, he's going to be teaching us about his mistakes, so we don't have to keep our resumes on standby on Glassdoor. All right, everyone, Hudson Bush. Um, this, honestly, this, I'm not from here, I'm from Southern California, and this is one of the biggest uh, B-sides I've been to, this is a nice event. Um, thanks so much to Andy, everyone else for putting this on, run really smooth so far. So, um, too small to fail. The, uh, the, the reason that I started giving talks, the reason I started speaking at conferences is because I, as I started coming to conferences, I realized that every single person I talked to was working at a small business. They were the only sysadmin. They were on a small team. But almost every single talk I was going to was, and then our incident response team of 15 people. And I'm like, it, it, and it makes sense because a lot of times at the more international conferences, things like that, you, the only people that end up coming the only people that end up having the budget to speak are large companies, so it's a little bit of a bias. So I, I'm in an interesting place where I work as an MSP, an MSSP, and I mostly work with small and medium businesses. Um, that kind of makes me a unicorn, I guess, because it, it isn't something that happens. Most of the time when I tell people that I work at small and medium, with small and medium businesses and security, people either say why or how, and that's essentially the whole point of this talk. I'm going to spend half of it talking about why small and medium businesses matter for security. Some of us should know that. Um, unfortunately, uh, a lot of companies don't, uh, especially vendors, MSSPs, a lot of them don't, don't even care about small and medium businesses. And then the other half talking a little bit more about the how. So I'm um, going to get, uh, get on a soapbox for a moment here. Um, this this slide. Um, I do not do Q and A time at the end. I do, as you saw, as you see in the bottom right, there is a hashtag. Um, you can tweet. You can hashtag. You can subtweet me. You can send me strange memes. I don't care. You can do do whatever. Um, but the and the reason I don't do that is because a lot of times, especially men, especially people who look like me, were kind of horrible. So. I don't know if you've noticed this, but what happens a lot of time, someone who looks like me will give a talk and afterwards all the questions will be, so that was great, what do you think about high level security concept or good question or something. And then um, a lot of times people who, again, don't look like me in, in various different ways will get a question, well, have you ever considered this or why didn't you do that? That is not a question. That is a, I really wish that I had the confidence to speak, and I didn't. So because of that, um, I noticed that too many times, and kind of in solidarity, I've just realized that Q&A is not inclusive for either speakers or participants, because the people who usually ask the questions are generally people who know something and are a little more confident, and they'd be willing to speak anyways. So with that same way, if you are someone that's willing to shout out, you can yell at me if I say something that you do not understand. You can ask a question if you're a little more shy. If you're not, seriously, yell, yell at me. I'm fine. Yell, elaborate, explain yourself, yell something. Yell, stop being an idiot if you want to yell that at me. Fine. Um, I'm, I don't care. I'm not offended. Um, so, I want to start off saying, so, so you know that you're in the right talk, you know what I'm trying to essentially instill here. I, I talked about this a bit on the intro slide, but if you work with a small and medium business, um, I know a lot of people use SME, I don't like that um, acronym because it's subject matter expert, and every time I'm like, you're talking about a business or a person, and then I get confused. So I use SMB, I know it's an older acronym, but I prefer it. Um, so give you a starting point, and that's in a lot of different ways. That's if you are really new to this industry, it gives you places to research. Um, if you don't know, if, if you do know security, but you have no idea where to start, um, same. And then give you tools to convince management 
If you are not a speaker, you are not someone who wants to talk to management for a half hour convincing them why to do security, if you are a sole sysadmin, then um, you can just hand them a slide, this slide or this talk. Um, backing up for a second, you, if, if I know that people are going to take pictures of the slides, that's, that's fine, but also if, if you want, I have the slides posted online, the last um, slide will give you a link to that. And everyone else, if you don't work in an SMB, especially if you work at a vendor or an MSP, this is essentially saying small, medium businesses are important and yes, and securable. A lot of people think it's just a futile ex exercise. I think that's obviously wrong. Um, so here are my two, this is just telling you where I'm gonna split this up into. The first is why why are SMBs important? Then I'm going to do how. How do we secure them? So, first, why? Um, there are 28.8 million SMBs and small and medium businesses in the U.S. And this is actually old statistics. I think this was 2017. Um, that represents 55% of all jobs in the U.S. But then at the same time, 65% of all spear phishing attempt, attempts are aimed at SMBs. So you just think that they're targeted. And then they're also important because chances are one in every two people that you know, which means a good chance people here are working in small and medium businesses. And you, you do know people who work at them. That means their jobs are in danger when, we're, when, when they're losing income when they're getting breached, when they're losing data. So, and then this, I mean, it's an, it's an easy talking point. Target breach was a result of a small HVAC vendor being breached. So, supply chain attacks. Uh, if, if you're not carrying, and, and you, you're seeing more and more large companies are carrying, for example, uh, like Raytheon, they just bought Force Point there a while ago, and they're, they're now targeting they're actually Raytheon's working as a as an MSP, as an MSSP for a lot of their customers. So it, or it's really interesting, um, and a lot of their suppliers. So, so then the question is, why do we dismiss small and medium businesses when it comes to InfoSec? Uh, and and I've seen it. I mean, there's a lot of um, I I have to even define small and medium business because a lot of times talking at these conferences, people define that as anything under about 1,500 employees. Um, 1,500 is actually pretty large. I'm talking, I'm generally talking from my experience in medium businesses between about 50 and 200. Um, but I know obviously a lot of these apply to smaller and even much larger. But it, it, I, there's, there's too many um, vendors. There's a lot of uh, next-gen antivirus companies or, or um, even um, EDR companies that will not even sell to you if you have less than 150 employees. Um, that that's stupid. That I, I I mean, there's no other way to put it. That's stupid. That's endangering companies to to not even sell. A lot of MSPs. Will, now there are obviously small boutique MSPs that only work with small medium businesses. But then when you get into the larger ones, they're like, oh, it's not even worth my time. So. Um, and that, that's part of, again, why I'm talking here. So the, the question, and actually, um, I, was, I was in the speaker's lounge before this, and um, one, one of the other speakers said, oh, you work with small and medium businesses. My least favorite part, I love working with small and medium businesses. And I'm going to talk in the very next slide about why I love working with them. But this is the part where most people hate. They, and this is what the other speaker was mentioning. I hate having to convince them to give me budget. Um, and, and I'm in a privileged position that I work with uh, mostly manufacturing companies, military manufacturing, tend to have a little more money. I have a camera and I'm probably moving out of frame, sorry. Um, mostly man military manufacturing, so there is compliance. So just like with any, I mean, there, there are two reasons that anyone ever spends money on security. There is because the government told you to and because you got breached. So essentially because the government told you to or a customer told you to, more or less is what it comes down to. 
Now I was working on a, an engagement recently, and I'm doing the scoping, I'm sitting down, and I'm just confused, and after about 15 minutes of talking to them, I'm like, I'm really confused. So you've never been breached? No. No compliance needs? No. So, so, so why are we here? He's like, well, because I'm scared about security, and I can't. I'm like, so you're smart? I don't even know how to do this. Like, I, I mean, it's a joke, but it's the same time. You don't run into that. You don't run into people who just want security for the sake of security. They want it because someone, something is forced in their hands. So that's obviously going to be one of your biggest, the, the biggest motivators. But I think you're in a unique situation with small and medium businesses because they do not have that same resilience. They do not have that same resources. Like, ah, if we lose $10 million today, it's no big deal. Um, you work at one of those companies. Um, but the thing is, a lot of times you're talking to an owner or a manager or someone with direct stake in this company. You can appeal to their pride. You can, I, I can't tell you how many times I've sat down with an owner and, and instead of just saying, hey, let me pitch you this, you sit down and say, so how'd you start your business? Tell me your story. Then they get this pride well up in them telling the last 25, 30, 40, 50 years about how they have built this company from scratch. And all it takes is you saying, so how important is this to you? This is a major risk out here and you don't want to lose what you have built. And you know, I, I hate I hate FUD, I, I hate fear, uncertainty, and doubt. I, you, I don't like to just say, you're gonna be breached and it's gonna be terrible and you're gonna lose millions of dollars. Um, that is not the way to get anyone to, I mean, that is not how you convince anyone to do something. Sure, you, you, if, if, you, if you have to give scary statistics, I like to leave people with hope. You essentially say, hey, it's a scary world out there. There are terrible people trying to do terrible things, but there's a way out. And not in even a salesy way, but just if you, if you leave on just FUD, you leave on just fear. No, no people don't like to buy on fear. You, you talk about, about the hope. You talk about what you can how you can prevent against it. You always end with practical. And, I, and again, I mean, some of this, because I am an MSP, sounds like I'm talking from outside, but if you're internal, it's that same sales pitch. If you're a sysadmin trying to talk to a CEO or a president of a company, whichever, it's that same sales pitch. You have to say, hey, security matters, this is why. Um, so you, unfortunately, you do have to be a bit of a salesperson there. Um, now this last point is, is actually uh, one, of, one of my favorites. Um, this was introduced to me, I forget the speaker's name, but <coughs> at B-Side San Francisco a couple years back. That in, InfoSec cybersecurity is not a profit center. It's never really gonna be a profit center. It doesn't make money, it's a cost center. But one of the ways to turn that on its head is introduce security as a sales and marketing tactic. And the easiest way to do that, not the cheapest, but the easiest and most efficient way to do that is getting ISO certification. Now that obviously costs money, it may not be the first thing you do, but if you can pursue that, put it on your website. The, the, every single conversation your salespeople have with a customer, first thing you say, one of the first things you say, before they ask, hey, what do you do about security? You say, oh, by the way, here's our security brochure. You prepare that marketing information, you give them that information before they ask. Because generally the first time a company ever talks about security is after a breach. That is the wrong time to talk about it. We want, if, if, and, and I have actually seen this tactic. Um, and obviously you don't need ISO. Um, you don't need to spend that money, but if you do, it gives that teeth behind it. And I, I don't just believe in that certification. I just know that, especially with manufacturing, so many of our customers already have to be ISO certified for QA. It's an easy sell. They're like, oh, one more ISO certification, I can get this, and boom. Um, and it really does work. Um, if, if you are a numbers person, if you are a quant, you can give those numbers and start talking to sales and say, hey, how, how many more sales do you think you've gotten? You know, do A-B testing, have a couple salespeople talk security, have them not do that. It's, it's interesting and it really is um, it, it, it's a, a different approach, and I think after time, you can start talking about security not as a cost center, but as a profit center, where you can start talking about security as, by the way, this is how much money you have saved by, you could have been breached, you could have lost efficiency, you could have done this or that, um, and then also adding the sales tactic into it. So, this is, this is a bit of the how you can convince people because again, this is the biggest pain point working with small and medium businesses. And then, oh, 
this is the, the why, why it's so fun. Why I, Working with larger businesses, you have complicated change control, you have so many different approval processes. But if you're sitting with the president or the CEO of a company and you ask him something, a lot of times he'll just say, here, do it. He can give you approval right then. You start right then. You don't have to then go to purchasing and acquisitions and you don't have to do every single every single piece you can just it, so so I love that about these companies and it can be so much easier because again I, I talked about that already I guess the uh, easier access to decision makers personal buy-in for management it's not a, an abstract concept what happens to this business if they get breached the owner knows, I mean, they know that risk. It's keeping them up at night. What happens if my business, if I go out of business and these 300 people, these 200 people, these 1,000 people that I'm employing directly cannot eat tomorrow? That keeps them up. Also, easier exper experimentation and piloting. I mean, you have direct access to users. You don't have that bureaucracy, so you can you can push something out to a subset of PCs, and it's, it's much easier because, again, the bureaucracy. Um, now, this last point, um, I'm going to talk about it as a positive here. I'm going to talk about it as a negative later. A smaller environment increases the ability to know where everything is and what it does. Um, I mean, the first thing we do when securing is we, we have to know what we're securing. We have, to do an, uh, we have to do an asset assessment, an asset inventory. It's a lot easier to do that when you have three rooms, four rooms, even just 200. You can almost walk around and inventory them manually. You don't want to, but you can confirm. You can look in every room and say, wait, I just counted 203 PCs, but I only see 202 on the inactive directory or in the asset inventory. So, um, and with that, it's also, you can know, when someone asks you a question, you can pull that up in your mind instead of just having to look at some sheet, because obviously you don't know everything about 1,500 PCs or 2,000 PCs or 32 servers, but if you have eight servers and 300 people, you can know that. So that, again, talking about it as positive, um, I'm gonna shift that in a second because it does have a negative side, obviously. So then how? Um, I obviously like to make things practical. There is, um, there are different approaches, obviously, because you can't just say, oh, this worked really well at this large business, let me apply this. I, we were working with a relatively small, um, a relatively small manufacturing company, about 250 people, and um, they brought in this guy who had previously been a, a CISO at huge company, 100,000 people, huge company, and he, he started moving to consulting. And he just kept saying, oh, it's easy, just do this. It's easy, just do this. Just, just implement the firewall rules. I'm like, Sure, that might be easy if your networking team is 30 people, which he mentioned that his networking team previously was around 30 people. If you can, you already know the environment that well, but it's a lot harder when you have one guy on site, one sysadmin who's already overworked, who's also the database admin and everything else, and you're like telling him to just implement these firewall rules. And I'm laughing at him like, you know how much testing? It, sure, if you have 30 people, you know, in one hour they can spend 30 man hours. I mean, it, it, but, but it, it's, it, you do obviously have to think about things a little different. So, um, in, in my bio, I, well, okay, he's jumping around. Um, in, my, in my bio, I do mention that um, I, I threat model everything um, and I risk assess everything. I am not a typical quant, I am not someone who just sees numbers for everything, but this is something we do terrible as an industry. We do not threat model well. We do not want to do risk management and assessment because we want to do what's fun, what's shiny, what's cool. So, but that is risk assessment and threat modeling is even more important with small and medium businesses because the thing is, you don't have all of these resources to throw at things. If you only have limited resources, you have to say, what actually is going to happen to me? What is most likely to happen to me, and how do I prioritize and secure against that first? What is it that the business has that they do not want to lose or cannot lose? Do that first. Don't just th come in and say, well, I heard about Meltdown Inspector, so I'm gonna spend all my time re-architecting against that. You know, that may not be the right way to do it. Um, Understand the types of attacks and the threats to expect, and then do not 
attempt to secure the same way a large enterprise would. I don't know why it's lagging today. Okay, threat modeling. Um, and this, this applies no matter what size business you are working with. Um, this, is a not, this is a really simplified definition of threat modeling. But know what you're protecting and know what you're protecting against. You, you can't just, you, you're not going to secure, you're not going to secure two items the same. You're not going to secure, you know, a little kick scooter and a Tesla the same. You're not going to secure these things differently. You're, you're, you're going to have to secure them differently. So you have to think, you have to know where your data is. You have to run through data classification. You have to find where your crown jewels are. And you have to also know, as a small business, what most likely are my attacks? Now obviously if you're working at a huge company, if you're working at a Google, you do need to protect against just about everything. But, but here, I, the, uh, most of us should know the defender's dilemma. If we're, we're, we're blue teamers. An attacker only needs to exploit one weakness, but a defender needs to protect against all weaknesses. I think that's wrong. I, I, I think that that is wrong, it's misleading, and it's scary. Because the thing is, especially at a small and medium business, a an attacker is never going to use all weaknesses. They're going to get to a certain point, and then they're going to give up. Because who the heck am I even trying to attack anyways? I don't even know what this company does. They're going to give up. So, and, and I say it's my definition of attacker's dilemma. Um, it is a bit different. But the reality is that we, not enough people are talking about the attacker's dilemma. And I think this is what, how we need to reframe it. A defender only needs to make it too expensive for an attacker to exploit a target given the value of that target. I'm going to repeat it, and then I'm going to explain it. A defender needs to make it too expensive for an attacker to exploit a target given the value of that target. So instead of the typical definition of the defender's dilemma is you're on a boat with a thousand holes and you're one person and you need to plug all those holes. And, and you're, it's this picture of someone frantically around trying to plug all these holes with only 10 fingers and 10 toes. Um, and that's obviously never going to work. But the reality is, there, there are two things that typically are going to happen that are to small and medium businesses. Fishing and ransomware. I mean, really, the non-targeted attacks, opportunistic attacks, as I like to call them, because more automated things. So, I we had a um, same, same same guy who kept saying, "Oh, it's so easy, just you know, just change these firewall rules." Was um, when he came in, the very first thing that he just kept saying we needed to do was hard drive encryption. Now, not a bad thing to do, great thing to do actually. But he just kept saying, "Just push hard drive encryption out. Just push BitLocker out. Just push it out." And I'm like. And, and he's like, why don't we just do that? It's it, do that first. And I'm like, now, thinking of threat modeling for a second, what are you trying to get and what do you have to do for hard drive encryption to even matter? One, that means you're trying to get a hard drive, weirdly enough. It's not data in transit where you're trying to, to catch things on the network. You're trying to get a hard drive. So how would you get a hard drive? Well, you have to be in the building. And then you have to actually remove, oh, in, in most of our environments, there's not a lot of salespeople. So aside from three laptops, sure, you can push, lap, you can push BitLocker to three laptops pretty easily. But, or you can send them new laptops if they're remote salespeople. But let's say you have 200 PCs just pushing BitLocker. What are you actually getting out of that? Why not, you know, maybe secure your, your building a little bit. And honestly, this is the only place I've ever not been able to tailgate my way into. I've never been able to follow someone into. So I'm like, well, finally one day he said it again in a meeting. He said it with the CEO and he just said, we, we need, I don't know why BitLocker isn't pushed everywhere. And I just, in a, in a fit of rage, do not do this, do not be me. But I just stood up and I'm like, okay, so you, you, you must think that the physical security of this building is so bad that someone's gonna steal a hard drive. Let's get facilities in here right now. Let's get them in here. Let's let them address your, your, your concerns. Or how about let's do this. If you're so concerned about hard drives being stolen, which 
That must be what you're concerned about here. Let's start locking the server room door. <laughs> but, but here's what's worse. So in this, you have to get in this building, you have to go into the IT office and then into the server room door. And neither of those doors are ever locked or closed. The reason that the server room door is not locked or closed is because the thermostat is on the IT side of it. So instead of having a portable, you know, a, a, a secondary thermostat in there, having a secondary air conditioning, no, they just don't, they don't even close or lock it. And then the reason that the IT door is not closed, and this, this, this just makes me angry to this day, is that so that the trash can be taken out at night. Now, the thing about a trash can, especially a small one, is that you can move it <laughs> outside of a door. And, 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 but that's the thing. So often we hear something, and I use Meltdown as an inspector as examples, because the thing is, for someone to use speculative execution threats against you means that they have tried everything. But also, to patch against those things, a lot of times you have to reduce your... Now, it's not a bad thing to patch. I think you should patch all the things. I'm going to talk about that again in a second. But that's not what you should rush to be doing. If you're not... If, if, you're, if you're still exposing port 3389 to the internet, but you're so concerned about Spectre and Meltdown, and you're spending all this time on emergency patching windows, maybe spend it on emergency port closing windows. Um, and that, that's my whole point here is that you should be estimating what happens to the business if something happens and the likelihood of that happening. And I, I know that obviously we don't have all the data, but you do know, as a, especially small and medium businesses, but really any business, that is the first thing. If you, if you aren't confident that you can protect against phishing and ransomware, we don't even deserve to be talking about the other things yet. Um, I gave a talk on that um, in, in Vancouver um, a, a couple months ago, where essentially my whole topic was we as an industry don't even deserve a lot of these nice fancy conferences where we're sitting talking about things like MFA bypass when no one would ever need to use that when you're going to, when, when most of your users will still click, yes, this was me. I was listening to a pen tester who says, I'm the worst pen tester in the world. Most of what I do is I'll just request the MFA key and nine times out of 10, your user will say, yep, this is me, and then I'll get into their cloud, their, their cloud dashboard. Admins, not even just users. And he's like, I, I've never had to use any of those MFA bypass tools that people are talking about. So let's, let's, let's start protecting against some of those things and since we, until we get all excited about the shiny things. And shiny things are fun. I mean, it's fun to talk about um, all of these threats, but when it comes down to it, you need to actually protect your environment and not just protect against imaginary things. So that comes down into hardening. And this is, again, kind of my own um, somewhat funny take on, um, on the typical um, definitions of hardening. So hardening and comes down to a few, three major things. Um, principle of least privilege, which, as I define it, is an account shouldn't be able to access anything that that account shouldn't have access to. Yep. Makes sense? I mean, obviously you can tease that out a thousand different ways, but essentially, if... If... Uh, I do a lot of mergers and acquisitions, and we came into a company that bought another company, and they... Um, I don't know how familiar with all of you are with Active Directory. But there is in but the um, the domain users group was in the administrators group. The domain in, not domain administrators but built in, which which is bad. That means essentially every single account can do everything that they need to do for the most part. Um, and the whole reason for that was that um, user. <laughs> Users needed to be able to remote to multiple different laptop, multiple different PCs from home. I mean, there's a whole group for that, for remote access. There, there, there's a whole group for it. But it was, I mean, so, so that's, that's principle of least privilege. That, sh that obviously most of us know that shouldn't happen, but it, it does come down to limit your access as much as you can. And the principle of least functionality, similar definition, a machine shouldn't be able to do anything that that machine shouldn't be able to do. So that's 
You know, you don't really need Candy Crush on that laptop. You, I, I hate that. I, I love that in Windows, in Server 2019, they removed it, but in Server 2016, um, Windows Live Authentication was a default service. Now, it was never enabled, but it's still just, every time I looked in the services, it just pissed me off that looking in there, I mean, why do I have a Windows, no, not Windows Live, an Xbox Live, sorry. Xbox Live Authenticator on my server. If anyone ever used that, I would love, I would love to hear why, but if, if, if we're in a real production. And then, the, again, I'm simplifying everything, but encrypt all the things, patch all the things. I'm, I made a joke about um, hard drive encryption, but at the same time, it, it's not, I mean, encrypt what you can, especially in transit. I mean, please be removing your XP machines and your Windows 7 machines. You can't encrypt SMB traffic if you still have Windows 7. You, you, you can't, so. Um, and then patch all the things. Though, I mean, this whole slide could be two or three different talks, so I'm going through it quick. Um, open source everything. Know how well you can see that red, but please don't. Now I'm a huge open source fan. Um, if you're more interested in what I what I have to say about open source, um, at, at the end of when I give my slides, there there is a um, a talk that I gave yesterday actually in Knoxville um, called "Building uh, Starting from Scratch: Building a Security Program in 365 Days," and I talk a lot about every single open source tool I use. I use a lot of them, but that may be nice to use all open source in a large, um, in a large environment, but as we all know, um, open source does cost less, but it costs more in human resources. It costs more in technical resource. You need to know more, and if you don't have time to know more, don't just say, oh, I'm gonna build this from some open source. Maybe consider actually paying for it. The larger the company gets, the more resources you have, the more I say, yeah, try and use open source. There's a ton of benefits for it. Um, if anyone here works at Splunk, I'm sorry. Um, you may not need a multi-million dollar sim. Um, e even if you can't afford it, you probably don't need it. Um, there are a lot of great tools out there. Again, um, I don't make a lot of friends at Splunk when I'm talking because uh, I, I like to call Splunk the uh, coffee break sim, that essentially you do a search, you go get coffee, you come back, you realize you search, you, you, you come back, you realize your search is just finished, but you probably wrote your query wrong, and then you go and uh, take a second coffee break, and 30 minutes later you might have some information. Um, you have to consider carefully what resources and scenarios need to be monitored, especially if you are using something like Splunk. And again, Splunk is a great product. It, it is, it's just, I think, uh, it, it's, so, it's, it's just not always the tool you need. But can consider what resources and scenarios need to be monitored. Now, the benefit in, in a small environment is that you can potentially monitor everything because there's less, there's less things to monitor, but at the same time, you may only be able to monitor a few things. And my favorite choice, if you can only monitor one thing, DNS logs. If you can only monitor one thing, get your DNS logs, monitor them. Um, Mark Baggett has some really cool tools for enriching DNS logs. Um, I probably should have put those on the resource slide at the end, but really cool tools where you can see how randomized, if it looks like DGA, if it looks like a random, non-legit website, um, and, or how young, because we've done this in our internal network, where essentially we block any webs, any domain that was registered in the last 30 days, not had a single false positive on that. And now, if you're a DevOps shop, it's gonna be different. You are gonna be registering domains. If you're dealing with web admins, it's gonna be a little different. You might have separate policies for them, but, um, it's something like 90% of all phishing attempts are made by domains that were registered in the last 24 hours. So, so getting your DNS logs, enriching them right, that is extremely important. And then, um, I, I haven't talked about it too much because, it, again, I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want to seem too biased, but there is a reason 
to consider an MSP and MSSP if you're a small business. Um, it's not always the right tool, but I mean, if you don't want to have to learn WSUS and start patching all of your servers, they'll have great tools, they'll have an RMM tool to patch your servers. MSSPs can be a benefit. I know, again, it's generally a dirty word, um, but it doesn't have to be. Um, if you need a consultant, bring them in. Especially, I, I, am, I am a huge fan of boutique MSPs, the smaller ones that can actually devote time to you. Um, that is ideal. So transition plan. This is what I like to call outgoing insider threat. Pun on insider threat. Um, because the reality is, it, like I said, what, I said one of the benefits of small and medium businesses is that one person can know everything. The, di the, the negative is that one person knows everything. And when they leave, they know everything. So you have to protect their knowledge a little more. You have to lock down even more. You have to consider this in advance. Because you may not even know what people use. Um, there was an MSSP that I was talking to the other day that they actually built their own password tool internally that every time a password was accessed, it was And now all of, their, all of their staff could access almost every password. I didn't love that. But what it did is it showed what passwords they've accessed. And that is actually great. You want something to show, you want to log what keys, what certificates, what, what who has what, because you, you need to have a transition plan. You need to have a password change plan. Um, this is also a fairly easy one. Ensure that there is a CFAA warning in your exit interview or termination process. That is a good way to scare the crap out of someone. Um, by the way, if you misuse any of this computer information that you have or you try and access our network remotely later, you will go to jail. That, that, that shuts people up pretty quick. So, um, talk to legal about that. Get that in, get, get that in writing. Um, I, I, I've just seen the look on people's faces when they have this kind of smug, oh, I'm going to get you, and then the moment that you talk about CFA, they just go, never mind, okay, fine, and they just back away. Um, backups, back up your data, check your backup, test your backup, alert on your backup, check your alerts and resolve your alerts. Um, backups are not fun, especially if you're using backup exec or something of the sort, it is not fun, but if you've never tested your backup, don't want to do it after a ransomware attack. Test it. Honestly, with the new ransomware that's out there that will in, uh, that will encrypt your archive backups, it'll go in. It'll. There, um, I believe it. Sam Sam Ryuk, all all that fa family will essentially sit in your network and it will encrypt your backups as they're happening weeks before you even know. So I'm starting to try as often as possible. Every single day I try to re restore one backup. Okay, uh, I'm gonna wrap up really, really quick. Easy slide. SMBs are important, they're targeted, they're similar, you need to back up, and the resource and risk assessment are even more important in small businesses than enterprise environments. Um, uh, my slides, you'll see them if you add me on Twitter, I'll post this link, and then homebrewsec.com forward slash talks, you can see my slides. Um, thank you so much for listening to me and uh, for your patience, thank you so much.